welcome to the Day Health Strategies podcast, Unlocking Accountable Care, Conversations on Healthcare Reform. This podcast features experts in the field talking about the most salient issues in healthcare reform. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unlocking Accountable Care. This is your host, Emily George, and I'm here today with Dr. Harold Cox, Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Associate Professor of Community Health Sciences at Boston University School of Public Health. Welcome to our show, Harold. Hey, thank you. Glad to be here. So you've had a very, very colorful career path. You've served in multiple roles in both academia, the community, and in government. And for those who do not know, among our listeners, Mayor Marty Walsh even made April 12th Harold Cox Day to recognize Harold for his many contributions to public health. And we're so excited to have you on the show, and we would love for you to spend just a few minutes telling us a little about your career path and what your current role is now. Sure. Thank you for having this chance to talk about that. I'm able to talk about my favorite topic, me. <laughs> so I am trained as a social worker. Um, begin my career very early in working with individuals who have developmental disabilities, and at that time we used the term mentally retarded individuals. Um, the, I worked in state schools and large congregate living arrangements, and worked in settings when we were deinstitutionalizing those large settings. So a lot of my early work was in developing community-based projects. Uh, did some more graduate work, got very involved in looking at issues around HIV, and developing services and programs for people who were impacted by AIDS during the early days of AIDS in the late 80s and early 90s. Then spent a very long chunk of time working for the Department of Public Health in Cambridge as the Chief Public Health Officer, and now am working as a professor and associate dean here at Boston University. Wonderful. Well, you know, there are so many things I could pick your brain on, but one of the things that we want to spend some time talking about today that many of our listeners may not know a lot about is the Massachusetts regulations around determination of need and the ways in which these regulations promote health access and equity across our state. And I was wondering, could you just start off by telling us a little bit about what is determination of need and why was this created? Sure. And, and it might be important for me to first tell you how I get involved with Absolutely. that particular project. I sit on the Public Health Council. The Public Health Council is the board of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. It's an appointment that's by the governor. And this board has the responsibility for doing regulatory activities and advising activities to the Commissioner of Public Health. So in that context, I get to work with this determination of need project. Now, what's determination of need? So determination of need projects in Massachusetts and the certificate of need projects across the country were really created to ensure that we didn't have overbuilding of health facilities. And the concern was that if you have an overbuilding of health facility, that it will result in health care price inflation. So this was a way of actually containing that and of actually saying, what's the need of the individual community? It was a way of being able to regulate the number of beds in hospitals and the number of beds in nursing homes. And organizations then needed to be able to say, here's what our interests are, here's what our systemic issues are, we as a hospital or we as an organization that wants to add more beds. And the state needed to be able to say, yes, that meets a particular need that we have in our community. That's really interesting. Can you talk through some of the factors that you use when you are approving these applications? When we are looking at the factors that help us to determine whether or not this should be approved, one of the things that we're asking is, so who are the patients? Does it meet a particular need in the community? In addition to, does it meet the need that a hospital is saying that it needs to make? So let me give you an example. Hospital X, and we won't talk about any specific hospital. Hospital X comes in and says, we want to expand the number of um, bays that are in our emergency department. 
because we see X number of people who are coming into the community, into our organization, and in order to effectively um, work with them, we need to be able to do that. If the cost of the project meets a certain threshold, then it automatically triggers the determination of need. And, and I'm, I'm going to get the numbers mixed up, but I, I think it's something like if the project is, I'm going to say this and then I might be wrong, but I think it's something if it's $18 million for certain kinds of projects, and if the capital cost come to a certain point, then it triggers the, um, the need for, for this determination of need evaluation. So what is the process like? The DON process is one that wants to ensure that we don't have duplication of services and that we aren't buying more technologies than we need to buy. And it's a way of ensuring that we're going to meet the needs of our local community. Now, where did they come from? Massachusetts actually started this process back in 1971 when the DON was actually first created. And, and as a result of what Massachusetts is doing and some other states were doing, the federal government created this project around looking at certificates of need. And certificates of need essentially was an opportunity for states to be able to say how, what kinds of beds they should have in hospitals and how many beds they should have in nursing homes. And there was a requirement in, back in the early 70s, around 74, that required all states to have this kind of operation that required them to make determinations about whether or not they needed more beds, more technology, and the like. There were many states that initially put this into operation. In around 1987, those laws were also repealed. And there were some states who moved away from doing this kind of certificate of need project. Massachusetts was not one of those states. Massachusetts continues to have its determination of need project. Now, we have done some modifications during that time. The most significant modification occurred, of course, when Massachusetts had its own affordable care um, health initiative here. And we were looking at the importance of the determination of need process as part of that overall plan and thinking about this as a way of helping to think about cost containment. But what we realized at that time was that it didn't go quite far enough and we needed to think more about population health and how it impacts people. So around two, year, two or three years ago, around 2017, we did some major modifications to our determination of need project. So essentially how it works is this. An organization decides that they want to build um, a new um, uh, emergency room or they want to put in a new CT scan or they want to put in a new MRI. And what that does is it triggers the determination of need initiative. And the determination of need initiative then involves a significant amount of evaluation. And I'll talk about some of those pieces that we're looking at, but it involves a significant amount of evaluation that gives us a chance to look at what are the needs of the community, whether or not the organization can um, fit the, do what they're suggesting. And our staff work with the organization that's interested in doing this. The staff then presents a document back to us, which is multiple, multiple pages that involves many different aspects of this organization. And our board then will make some determination of, yes, we should go forward, we should not go forward. So as we think then about what is it that the staff are looking at, there are a number of pieces that they're looking at, and there are actually six factors. The first is about patient need. So what's the panel? What does the panel look like of the people that are going to receive the service? It's important for us to also then think about the, um, the, the measurable health outcomes. What's the intended purpose of doing this particular thing? And does it meet the state's interest in thinking about cost containment and about improving health care, health outcomes for the state? Thirdly, we want to think about issues around compliance. 
is the organization that's applying for it, are they meeting state, local, federal guidelines? We're looking at issues around um, feasibility, financial feasibility. Do they have the money to do the particular thing that they want to do? We we'll also want to look at the issue around relative merit, meaning is this the best alternative to do the particular thing that they want to do? And then the really big major, it's all of these are major, but one of the really big pieces of this is around community health initiatives, community-based health initiatives. How does this fit in the departments, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health? Um, priorities in meeting some needs of addressing social determinants of health and a variety of other kinds of things that the department is interested in. I should mention one of the important pieces that happens with this project, especially when it comes to the community health initiatives, is when an organization is going to have a project of a certain size, they also then need to contribute a certain percentage of those dollars to the community health initiatives. And so I think it's something like 5% of the total cost of a project then need to be paid to, um, to the local community and to a fund that is managed by the Department of Public Health to address uh, community initiatives. So this is, the organization comes in and says, we have a building project of X size and they are then assessed a fee. That, that's probably not the right word, but they are assessed, um, uh, they're saying that there's some benefit then that the community should get as a result of what this hospital is actually doing. And so I think it's something like 5% of the total cost of, of a capital expenditure, up to 5%, or, or it's equal to 5% or more that they need to contribute. And these dollars are then used by the local community to, um, to do community health assessment and community health projects. A, an example of a project that I'm really excited about is uh, one of our determination of need projects that can result of these funding provides funding for individuals who are at risk of losing their housing. And these are individuals who are in low-income housing, and they can apply for money to help pay for their, their housing. They, they've had a problem with housing because of either some uh, hospital expenses that they've had or something that was, that was unusual for them and they are in jeopardy of becoming homeless. So this particular fund was created so that individuals could then apply for these dollars. That fund comes as a result of money that was from the community health initiative uh, dollars that the particular hospital that we're talking about um, has available. Wow, that is really fascinating. And so um, can you, um can you go into more detail about just holistically how this process and this evaluation that you guys do and the, the different pieces that hold these centers or facilities accountable, how does this help promote health equity in general across our state? Well, in a, in a couple of different ways. One, in, with the assessment that's being done, we're asking the question of what's the need of the community? So the organization has come in and said, we need to increase the number of bays in our emergency department. But what the state is interested in is, so is it to the benefit of the people in the local community? And the state gets a chance to then say, here's where we want our state to be in terms of health delivery. How does this particular initiative help to do that particular thing? That's one. So we're asking a question of what are the needs of the community? Secondly, with this fund that's created, we are providing dollars then that can be used by the local community to address any number of needs of that local community, as well as some of those dollars and part of this project is to think statewide that the fund that a uh, portion of those dollars that go into the statewide fund will be able to contribute to projects that are across the state. Because 
many of our hospitals and many of the organizations may only be in one part of the state, but we have needs across the whole state. So these dollars then can, can be distributed throughout the whole state. And thirdly, there is a process for allowing communities to be able to say, this is not working for us. We have had instances where a hospital or a health system will determine that they want to do a particular, they want to shut down a hospital or they want to add a particular service or they want to, come, they want to merge something. And community groups called 10 taxpayer groups will form that then come and they are speaking in opposition. Sometimes they're speaking in opposition, sometimes they're speaking for, but uh, many times they're speaking in opposition to a particular initiative. And they then give a voice to be able to say, this works for us, this does not work for us. In addition to that, the community health initiative component that I mentioned, which is factor six, I think, provides for an opportunity for the people in the local community to be involved in the assessment process that's happening. So the hospital or the healthcare system needs to engage its local community in the process it's involved in. So all of those pieces then contribute to the issue of thinking about equity. And so it's, I'm really curious how I know that implementation is always difficult to some of these initiatives. and. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you've seen play out um, on the ground or opportunities that you've seen? Sure. So remember, my work in particular is being as a policymaker in our, on our PHC, the um, Public Health Council. We have a staff at the Department of Public Health who are responsible for monitoring what happens. And an important part of what happens in our meetings is actually saying to the staff, this works, this does not work, here are some additional pieces that we should put in place. One of the things that will often happen is during the course of our meetings, we will ask the staff and we will ask the applicant to, um, to come back to us with additional information of how did that work out? Did this particular thing that you do, did it actually meet the need that you said was going to meet? And that's particularly important when you have community groups who also come to us and say, we aren't quite certain that this actually works for us. So we are interested then in getting feedback from the, um, from the organization. Now an organization will have the responsibility for coming back to us and giving feedback to the staff, collecting a certain amount of data, and the improvements that I mentioned that we did in the most recent uh, reframing of the DON process allows for better usage and better um, evaluation of the activities that are happening. I should mention that the DON process has been around for, as we've said, for quite a while. We have the improvements that have made with the most recent reframing of it have really strengthened it. Because I think that while I've been on this um, council for a long time, I do think that in the early days of my involvement in it, I think that the DON process was maybe not as strong as it needed to be. I do think that the reframing has allowed for us to have these six factors that I mentioned and has really given us an opportunity to look more carefully at so what's working, what's not working. Um, indeed, we work with a number of lawyers who are trying to make certain that we are staying within the regulation that we have. Um, and sometimes we just have a, a bully pulpit that says, I don't think that ought to be that way. Uh, so there are things that we can do because of the regulation, because it gives us the right to do it. There's some other things that we get to say, I think you ought to rethink this a little bit, but really speaking from the perspective of the bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, so can you speak to some of the successes of this program or what you've seen as far as how it's meeting some of these gaps in our state? Yeah, I think that what this has given us an opportunity to do is to look at how do we deliver healthcare in the state and where are the services that are happening. And one of the real successes I would say around this initiative 
this DON process is thinking about what the community health initiatives do. That the community health initiatives, this bolus of dollars that then becomes available to the community, is able to address a number of concerns that happen. And one of the things that, that I have just seen just recently is here in Boston, where there are a number of hospitals, in the past, each of these hospitals would have done that thing individually. As a result of this process, we have seen a, a number, in fact, all of the hospitals in Boston are joining together to do a common assessment of what are the needs in the city. And will then be able to then use their DON processes as a way of saying, here's the needs that we have in our community. Here's a way that we can work on them collaboratively. So this process then allows us both to ask the question of, are we duplicating services? Um, are we holding service? Are we holding costs down? But then to also look very carefully at what are the needs of the community as we think about social determinants of health. What are the needs of the community that we can address? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. You know, I um, have just one last question for you as we are wrapping up, and I'm curious just from a policy perspective, what's next or what are some things that you are thinking about for the future with either improving this service or this these regulations or other things across the state? You know, I said a moment ago that we made some significant changes both when the um, when the Affordable Care Act was, when we did our activities here in Massachusetts, and then a couple of years ago when we did some reframing. So one of the things you've got to do is to make certain that, that the six factors that we have really work for us. And are there some additional pieces that we need to put in place? So I think the first thing is we want to make certain that this process actually worked. I suspect that there are some of us who believe that we can go a step further. We've certainly gone further than we have in the past, but we may need to go a step further as well. But I want to live with this process first. I also am really excited about what's happening around being able to use this framework as a way of thinking about collective actions that we can do here in the state so that we can address any number of concerns. Massachusetts on one scale is seen as being one of the healthiest states in the country. But when you then disaggregate that and look at specific communities, they, everyone is not equally healthy. So I think this process can certainly help to contribute to some learning, some new programs, some way of thinking, some new activities that will help us to address a broader needs of individuals. So I think that there's more work to do around determination of need, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you so much for, for talking us through some of these um, regulations that are helping improve the, the access and equity and services across our state. Your insights have been so helpful, and we are excited to see what comes next. And thank you for all your service to us and to the state, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Emily. Thank you for tuning in to the Day Health Strategies podcast, Unlocking Accountable Care, Conversations on Healthcare Reform. Day Health Strategies is a Boston-based, mission-driven healthcare consulting firm specializing in providing timely and effective solutions to complex problems in healthcare. To learn more about our work, please visit our website at www.dayhealthstrategies.com or follow us on Twitter at dayhealthstrat. Just a reminder, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policies or positions of Day Health Strategies. Unlocking Accountable Care is a production of Day Health Strategies. Our producer and host is Emily George. Editing is done by Kate Autumn. Special thanks to Purple Planet for the use of their songs.